Hello and today we are going to follow up on our Japanese adventure as we had the great opportunity of understanding a bit better the Seiko company or should I say companies because yes Seiko is a pretty large group it's big it doesn't only produce watches but mainly of course it's a full consortium of companies and to be honest it's quite complicated to explain and I will do my very best with this and make it as comprehensible as possible. So in this video I will focus more on the actual history of the company the main milestone stones in terms of products so definitely one of our who's who uh, of watchmaking video but we unfortunately uh, didn't have the opportunity of visiting Seiko's actual various production sites scattered around Japan and I really hope uh, we'll be able to do so in the near future because this obviously is of great interest to us and for you probably too. Anyhow, we still managed to visit some of Seiko's Tokyo landmarks including their museum, historic boutiques and this will allow us to tell a very interesting and dense story. But before diving into this, let's quickly go back in history as one of Japan's specificity before adopting the same time system as we all know today was that time was defined by the seasons and more importantly a time of sunrise and sunset and more specifically units of times varied uh, during the same day. So I won't go into details of this, it's really a fascinating, complex and even poetic subject in itself and deserves a full video of itself. But we saw some example of these uh, clocks in the Seiko Museum Anyhow, the implication of this is that mechanical watchmaking in Japan didn't really develop as it did in the West and when in 1872 Japan switched to the time this uh, system we know today, 24 hours of equal length, well they were slightly left behind in terms of precision and the know-how to achieve it. So meaning that all good time-telling objects were imported and that's approximately when Seiko's founder Kintaro Hattori started to work as a watchmaker apprentice in 1874 at the early age of 13 in a watch repair shop. By 1881, guided by his entrepreneurial spirit, he established his own boutique at age 21 known as K. Hattori & Company to sell and repair imported clocks and pocket watches. Eleven years later, in 1892, Kintaro Hattori went further and set up his own manufacturing facility named the Saikosha Factory in order to produce wall clocks and Saikosha can be translated more or less in the, into the, the house of exquisite craftsmanship. This company was now able to produce internally practically all required elements and components for these clocks but also the dials, hands, the boxes and therefore was already some kind of fully integrated operation. In 1894 he established a new shop in Ginza in Tokyo and placed a tower clock on top of it something which rapidly became some kind of landmark and something which is still reminded today though naturally we are not talking the same building. By 1895 the Saikosha factory was able to produce their own pocket watches also and by 1899 their own alarm clocks which were not only popular in Japan but also in China and uh, one of the main reasons for this and apart from the overall quality was that it used nickel plated rust proof cases something highly appreciated in humid environments. So in less than 10 years this company could produce wall clocks, alarm clocks and pocket watches a rather rapid development uh, when you consider that it started from almost almost nothing and this was about to accelerate even further as Mr. Kintaro Hattori traveled to the west, studied the production means there, brought this back to Japan and this helped industrialize the entire production process. Something which was even pushed further as the company's uh, first diversification of activity occurred when the company was asked uh, to contribute to the then war efforts between Japan and Russia in 1905 and was mandated to work on developing fuses for the artillery. This again accelerated the industrialization of production methods of the company which translated for instance and very importantly in being able to automate precise pinion manufacturing which led them to produce a massive commercial hit for them the Empire pocket watch introduced in 1909. But before this pocket watch part of the business had been suffering and had uh, accumulated serious losses uh, demonstrating once again that perseverance and good fortune if one can say so when you put this in the context of wars and uh, its horrible consequences but yes demonstrating that this can indeed pay off but I would also add vision and the capacity of adapting to changing environments. Something again proven when Mr. Hattori and his company started to work on their first wristwatch in 1913, the Laurel, 
And one has to remember that at the time, really not that many companies around the world were heading into that direction. Came World War I, the demand of wristwatches exploded, and no pun intended, and Seikosha had really become a very dominant player in Japan, accounting for more than half of the country's production capabilities. But in 1923, a serious misfortune had a massive impact on the development of the company. The Great Kanto Earthquake occurred in September of that year, and with it colossal uh, destructions, among which the entire Seikosha factory. But in less than six months, production capabilities were put back in order and actually improved with new machines and techniques. And the Seiko brand uh, that we know today was actually created in that year. In 1929, Seikosha watches were chosen by the uh, Japanese rail uh, company to become the official timekeeper of the system before Western watches had been used. So naturally, I mean, it was a, mom a moment of immense uh, pride for the company and proving that it had now seriously caught up with the quality standard of its time. In 1932, their iconic uh, Ginza building had been fully restored, a building still standing today and home of Waco, the retailing arm of the group. Despite uh, Kintaro Hattori's passing away in 1934, production capability developments continued even further under the supervision of his eldest son, Genzo Hattori. So it remained uh, much a family business and by 1936, Seiko and Saikosha produced around 2 million watches per year. But the coming Sino-Japanese War and of course World War II meant that practically all of its production capability was then used for military purposes. And in 1945, this meant that only 20,000 watches were then produced, but these numbers went back above the 2 million mark already by 1953, the company having started to appeal more and more to a larger customer base, uh, for instance by using new advertising means and was the first company to run radio and TV commercials in Japan in the early 50s. At the same time, the company started to invest quite heavily on technological developments. In 1956, Seiko introduced the Marvel with the clear intention of competing against uh, Swiss watch brands, with the notion of precision and quality being at the center of their quest. Something repeated in 1959 with the Crown, and in 1960 came the first watch marketed under Grand Seiko name to position it above the rest of their product offering, and this watch was developed on the base of the Crown. In 1963, the brand introduced a sportier watch with the self-winding Seiko Sportmatic 5 to appeal to younger consumer. And the next big milestone was represented by the 1964 Tokyo Olympics as the brand was chosen to be the official timekeeper of the sporting event. This gave the brand immense international exposure and uh, it supplied the Olympics with not only uh, mechanical chronometers but also introduced what it had been working on for years uh, with the first portable quartz chronometers and the printing timing machines, which led uh, to another important spin-off activity of the company, something we still know today under the Epsom name. So Olympic timing had been taken care of exclusively before by uh, Swiss brands, Omega and Longines since the 1932 Los Angeles Olympics, and it's still an Omega territory until today. So this represented at the time a huge opportunity to demonstrate their know-how, but of course they knew that this was a big challenge that they couldn't mess up well, they didn't, and different companies of the group were tasked to develop these timekeeping uh, instruments, and yes, Seiko was already a pretty important group of companies with very different specificities. Based on this success and the technology developed for the occasion, Seiko went on to produce a watch that would have a massive historical consequence uh, with the introduction of the first quartz wristwatch in 1969, the Astron 35SQ. And I will get back to this, but Seiko nevertheless hadn't put on the side their quest for mechanical excellence, as in 1968, it got formal recognition on their precision acknowledged by the Geneva Observatory competition, something which obviously, and again, brought a lot of pride to the company and represented a slight kick in the back uh, for the Swiss. But the Astron turned out to become a much more serious offset for the Swiss industry. And you have to remember that uh, the Swiss had also been working on quartz development, even for once pooling R&D resources between some of the brands. But they for sure didn't manage to transform this into the commercial success like the Japanese. This in a way demonstrates something unfortunately pretty Swiss when it comes to changing times. And you know, like we've been doing this for the last hundred years, we've been successful at it, so no reason to change anything, others are wrong and that's it. 
Well, kind of a simple and uh, questionable visionary way of thinking, something witnessed again quite recently with the development of the connected watch market. Many in Switzerland have been saying that smart watches wouldn't have any impact on their business. And you seriously don't have to be a genius to know how wrong uh, this assessment was. Okay, I do get that it won't have uh, many impacts on, let's say, Global Force or even Patek Philippe and the likes, meaning the very high-end part of the pyramid. But the vast majority of Swiss-made watches in terms of volumes is found below the 1000 US dollar mark. And when you put back uh, some kind of functionality on your wrist uh, for twice uh, less money, well, it does get complicated for these brands with low or mid entry level products. And today, Apple alone accounts for more than the entire Swiss industry combines, combined in terms of overall turnover. And this happened in just a few years. Well, coming back to the impact of the Astron, uh, this quartz watch represents uh, this shifting moment which took an immense toll on the Swiss mechanical watch industry in the 70s and 80s, almost killing it actually. But other companies around the world had also been working on this electronization of watches, uh, mainly Hamilton already in 1957 with the first uh, battery powered watch, which still counted on a mechanical regulating organ, but also Bulova with the Accutron. And this definitely triggered some kind of arm race between challenging uh, brands. But Seiko came out the winner of this one and let's say the most prominent actor. When the Astron 35 SQ came out, it wasn't cheap and costed the equivalent of a small car, but continuous development made this base technological breakthrough more affordable and of course reliable and precise. In 2014, this watch actually entered the Washington Smithsonian Museum for what it represented in terms of technological significance and was certified as a mechanical engineering heritage of Japan. But unlike Bulova, which kept its technology to themselves, Seiko made most of uh, their patents available to others. And many of them adopted the Seiko system, which resulted in a tremendous boom of quartz watches available on the market. And definitely, well, it did hurt the traditional mechanical watchmakers, in particular the Swiss, but other producers from other country, uh, countries also took a big hit and actually only the Swiss managed to rebound thanks to the vision of some great names of uh, watchmaking. Otherwise, I sincerely feel that I wouldn't even be in a position uh, to talk today about what we love so much on this channel. In the 70s, the Seiko Group started commercializing watches under different names too, such as Loris, Alba and Pulsar. But increasing competition made times much more difficult for them and the dominant position uh, they were enjoying in their segment well, was actually seriously challenged by other brands and players. So to counter this, Seiko continued to innovate, introducing, for instance, uh, smaller and thinner size movements. But they were also uh, the first to come up with a digital quartz watch with LCD display in 1973. And in 1982, they came out with the very first black and white LCD television watch. How cool is this one? And so cool, in fact, that it was featured in James Bond Octopussy. But uh, they didn't stop there. And I have to say that this is really a part of the company that I appreciate a lot. So simply never stand still and the pursuit with this uh, uh, spirit with other innovative products such as the Scuba Master with its computerized dive tables, the Seiko Perpetual Calendar, the first quartz watch with the fully automatic 1100 year calendar. And of course, the Kinetic Collection introduced in 1988, which as its name suggests, uses the wearer's movement to fuel up these uh, micro generators used in these watches. And if I go slightly back in time, in 1977, Seiko developed a solar powered watch, uh, but one had to wait till the 90s before the technology was really mastered and put into the successor of this initial Astron course watch. So the Astron became a huge success. And in 2012, well, they added a GPS functionality, which synchronizes with at least four satellites to always display your correct local time. So always this idea of precision behind their development. In the 90s, Seiko also worked on radio controlled watches, but this uh, system really never made it out of Japan. But 1977 was a, a very fruitful year in terms of R&D because another very significant innovation came out of their labs uh, with the premises of the spring drive movement. But again, an innovation that would take years before making it on the commercial scene. It was first introduced to the public in 1998, encased in a sellable Seiko, but also a Credo watch in 1999. Yes, Credo, that's another brand we haven't yet talked about. 
but is also part of this uh, myriad of companies and brands in the Seiko galaxy. The technical prowess achieved by this movement is a precision of one second per day and represents a mix of different technologies, makes it quite hard to categorize in fact. But to summarize it as simple as I can, well the first two stages of the watch are classical, I mean by mechanical standards. First mainspring and barrel to store the energy, then uh, regular gear trains, but it's the regulating organ that differs quite significantly. So instead of an anchor and balance wheel system, the spring drive uses a tri-synchro regulator system which delivers or frees the energy of the watch based on the reference quartz signal. I won't go into the details of this, I mean it's very interesting but rather complicated. Uh, but one of the main outcome of this is that instead of having a beating second hand, and what I mean by this is that if you take any watch and if you could slow down the, with ultra slow motion the movement of the, your second hand, you would actually see that even if you think that this hand is moving continuously, well actually there are very small and short increments. It's not continuous. Something precisely achieved with the spring drive movement, but again it's the end result that counts, meaning precision. You now find this movement in several collections of the brand or brands, uh, from the Prospects line to Grand Seiko and naturally Credor timepieces. So let's now come back on Grand Seiko, which uh, kind of gently faded away from its pretty prestigious positioning as a serious mechanical watch option, but faced against all the technical innovations that we went through and these uh, changing times, where it was naturally quite hard to stay in the limelight. But in 1998, it was decided to give it some special attention. The Swiss high-end mechanical watch industry had proved by then that there was still an important appeal for these kind of products, and Grand Seiko came out with a series of new watches that follow this trend. So year after year we are, we've seen some really interesting watches, there's a few that I personally wouldn't mind wearing at all, and even as a good little Swiss I have to admit that Grand Seiko watches uh, can make some uh, Swiss products rather pale in comparison, especially in terms of price for the quality uh, you're getting. And I do like uh, that, uh, like in the 60s when they were competing on Swiss territory during, uh, during the good times of all these uh, chronometry competition, something which uh, sadly has disappeared as no one any longer wants to be directly compared to their competitors, well Seiko or Grand Seiko are coming back to almost all the editions of the GPHG and competing quite proudly and they did win some important prizes, so the jury precisely recognizing the quality of what has been achieved. Anyhow, there is still so much to be said regarding Seiko, but like I mentioned in the intro of this who's who of watchmaking, it's big, it's complicated, you have tens and tens of companies intertwined uh, one way or another, uh, sometimes directly competing against each other, uh, you have slightly complicated product segmentation within these brands, uh, for instance before going to Japan on this great experience, Credo represented for me the very pinnacle of high-end watchmaking in Seiko's uh, constellation of brands, uh, with exceptional, you know, like tourbillons, minute repeaters, extreme high-end finishing, well, you name it. But it turns out that, that you can also buy rather cheap Credo quartz watches, so yes, uh, I guess you get it that I did get a little bit confused there, but nevertheless it's an amazing company. I would really love to make some kind of our signature walkthrough videos of their manufacturing facilities. It must be absolutely fascinating, so hopefully one day. Another interesting aspect of the company is that the original family is still very much uh, involved. And today it is Mr. Shinji Hattori, the great grandson of Kintaro Hattori, who is at the helm of the company and the family values of innovation, precision and quality still prevails quite distinctively. I'm pretty sure that there is still much uh, to be seen in terms of innovative solutions and though Seiko is just as exposed to the menace of connected watches as other brands mentioned before, well I am also quite convinced that their capability of adapting to changing rules means that their future will be a very interesting one. So this is it for this who's who of watchmaking dedicated to the Seiko group. And one last word, but I just uh, wanted to mention that Grand Seiko has now become a full brand of its own. And I guess uh, with the clear intention of trying to redistribute some of the cards among the big names of the watchmaking industry as we know it today. Evolution of the perception of such watches uh, in the eye of the consumer means that indeed some uh, Swiss people better be pretty alert about it and do what it takes not to be taken off guard. Good luck to them. Thanks for watching. Arigato kosaimas. Hope you liked it. See you real soon and a huge Viva Watchmaking to you.